a woman had a problem with her husband. He snored. And she could not get a good night's sleep. He had, he had a problem, a real problem. He would go out with his friends. He would have too much to drink. And he would come home and, and just fall into bed and start sawing logs. And she just was not getting good sleep. It was starting to affect her. And so she went online. What do I do? She's looking up snoring remedies. And she tried several of them. None of them worked. One night, he comes home late. Again, he's had too much to drink. He just falls into bed, doesn't even take his clothes off, and just goes to sleep and starts snoring. And so she had got up, couldn't sleep, went back online, stopped snoring, husband, and found this one remedy that she said, this is ridiculous. The person said on there, uh, tape a piece of ribbon to the person's nose. And she said, how's that going to help? I've tried all these other ones, why not? She goes and opens up her dresser, pulls out a blue ribbon, uh, grabs a Band-Aid out of the bathroom, tapes it to his nose, and sure enough, he stops snoring. So the next morning, he wakes up, and, and she says to him, where were you last night? And he looks in the mirror, and he says, I don't know, but wherever it was, I won first place. <laughs> this guy had a problem. His wife had t tried to talk to him about it over the years. Honey, you, 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 you can't drink. It's, it's you know, and she tried to talk to him. He just wouldn't listen. He pretended that everything was, was fine, though his behavior was causing problems. Uh, that's the subject we're going to be looking at this morning. Um, we're starting a new study, obviously, this morning in 1 John. Uh, we're going to get into the background of the book uh, on Wednesday evening, for now, let me just say that uh, the John who wrote this is the brother of James, uh, two of the commercial fishermen that Jesus called to follow him as the, the 12 disciples. Uh, John was most likely the youngest of the disciples. Uh, he was probably, when he first was called by Jesus, right around 14 years old. He lived into the 90s of the first century. He wrote, of course, the Gospel of John three letters in the New Testament, and then the book of Revelation. Now, he's going to deal with several things in this first epistle, uh, all of them related to knowing God and how that translates into understanding who we are and how it affects how we live, specifically our relationships. We refer to verse 9 a lot here at Calvary Chapel. Um, if you've been here for a few months, you've probably heard me quote, 1 John 1, 9, three, four times, um, because it is one of those verses that's just essential to the Christian walk, to the Christian life. And what I hope today is, is uh, uh, as we go deep into verses 8 and 9, I, I, what I'm hoping is that you will remember this message so that when you hear someone quote 1 John 1, 9 in the future, you'll remember this message and all that's contained in it. You know, you say 1 John 1, 9, and it becomes kind of this verbal shorthand for this entire message. So, so try to remember that if you can. Look at verse 8 as we get started. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, John wrote to clear up a goofy idea. There's some discussion among scholars over what the air was that he's addressing here in verse 8. And the consensus is that he's, he's dealing with um, a very early form of something that came to be called Gnosticism. Uh, false teachers are sharp. Uh, they use the same words that Christians do, but they pour different meanings into them. They use the same vocabulary, but they have a different dictionary. Uh, if, if this has ever happened to you, a Saturday comes and there's a knock at the door, and you open the door and there's a couple of very well-dressed people there, and they want to talk to you about the gospel of the kingdom. Uh, and, and so, and you, oh, the gospel, kingdom, I know those words. We just sang about the king. Um, and, and so they, well, oh, oh, you, and so they begin to share. It turns out uh, the gospel that they're sharing is not the gospel. And the kingdom they're talking about is not the, the kingdom of, of God. The Jesus that they're preaching isn't the Jesus of, of the Bible. It's not our Jesus. They pour different meanings into these words. Well, this is what was happening with the Gnostics. The Gnostics were taking our words, our vocabulary, and they were putting different meanings into them, and it was fooling new believers that hadn't been taught yet. 
And so they're, they're, they're now hearing uh, what will, well, it's, they're talking about the gospel, they're talking about Jesus, they're talking about salvation. That's the Christian message. That's what I was one to. But, but the Gnostics were saying, well, you, you need to understand that what salvation is, salvation is enlightenment. Salvation's not forgiveness of sin and the promise of eternal life. No, salvation is enlightenment. The, the, it's all up here. See, the word gnosis that they get the word Gnostic from means knowledge. It's the Greek word for knowledge. And the Gnostics said, we have a secret teaching. Jesus had two teachings. One was public and the other was secret. And, and the secret knowledge was passed on to the apostles who passed it on to our Gnostic leaders years ago. And they've passed it on to us now. And, and, and if you pay us a certain amount of money, we'll share the secret knowledge with you. Then you'll be enlightened. Now, if that sounds a little bit like a modern cult called Scientology, you know that there's nothing new under the sun. It's exactly the message of Scientology, which is interesting, isn't it? Gnosticism, knowingism, Scientology, knowingism, right? It's all the same thing. It's just been pack, repackaged in, in the modern era. You see, the Gnostics said that once you were enlightened, you transcended the rules of morality. So you can't really sin anymore. And it was an appealing message to people because everybody wants to sin, but they want to do it without feeling guilty. And so now you can't really sin. Any, if you know the secret knowledge, you can't really sin. And so people were lining up to learn the Gnostic message. So John writes, if we say that we have, what, no sin, we deceive ourselves. You see how it's the opposite of knowledge? You're lying to yourself. And the truth is not in us. My brothers and sisters, as long as we live in these mortal bodies, we are going to mess up. Can I get an amen? In chapter 2, John says that if we are born again, we will not habitually sin. We won't be at peace with sin. We won't settle into compromise with it. We won't rationalize and excuse our sin. The evidence that we have been born again is that though we sin, we don't want to. We hate that we want to sin. None is sinless. We all sin. Now, I doubt anyone here is going to deny that. We all accept that. While John was most likely dealing with the false teaching of Gnosticism in verse 8, that's not the problem for us today. We don't need Gnosticism's promoting the idea of sinlessness. We have, well, we have secular postmodernism with its insistence that morality is self-defined. You're not the boss of me. No one's my boss. I make my own rules. In fact, I define reality. I am whoever and whatever I want to be. Isn't that the message of today? That's the, the banner over transgenderism. You, you can define whatever you want to be. Verse 8 is true. All sin. Can I get an amen? Everyone sins. Question. And respond out loud, please. Do you sin? Yes. Turn to your neighbor and tell how. Oh, I sin. Oh, be specific. No. Yeah. Uh -uh. That's what John deals with next. Look at verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That, that Greek word forgive means to send away. And very early in Greek usage, it came to mean forgiving by sending blame away, by, by letting blame go. When God forgives, he sends guilt away. As the prophet Micah says, that he, he, he takes our sin from us and he buries it in the depths of the sea. John conditions forgiveness on what? What's the condition? Confession. Now, confess means to agree with someone about something. To agree with them. When we confess our sins, we agree with God about them. N not the world, we agree with God about our sin. We align our view with His about how wrong sin is. We don't rationalize saying, well, everyone's doing it. 
I, I was born this way. I can't help myself. It was my parents' fault. We don't excuse or redefine sin. In confessing sin, we agree with God about it, not the world. You know, as you know, <laughs> sin has had something of a facelift over the last few decades, hasn't it? It's not gluttony, it's overindulgence. It's not lust, it's acute attraction disorder. It's not, it's not teenage rebellion, they're oppositional. Man, I wish I had that when I was growing up. People don't commit adultery. No, no, no. They're just expressing their evolutionary predisposition to maximize the distribution of their genetic material. I actually read that in an article years ago. I actually, word for word. The word sin is so religious sounding, isn't it? That's a church word. I doubt you had a conversation uh, at work this week and somebody was talking about sin. The word doesn't come up. It's a church word. It's, it, it sounds puritanical to many people. And that's why many pulpits today won't use the word sin. They've come up with all kinds of euphemisms for sin. Hurts, habits, hang-ups, failures, foibles, boo-boos, blunders, bounced spiritual checks, moral lapses, oversights, indiscretions, shortcomings. Now, it's not wrong to use those on occasion, but we must not hesitate to call it for what it is. It's sin. And agree with God on it. John says, if we confess our sins, they're ours. We did them. We need to own it and stop shifting the blame. You know, the tendency to shift responsibility for our failures, it goes all the way back to the beginning, doesn't it? Think about it. Adam. He and Eve ate eat of the tree. They go into hiding. God, God comes. Adam, what have you done? The woman you gave me. First words out of it, it was her fault. And by the way, you gave her. Notice the implication there. It's her fault and God. Now, Eve's a quick study because when God says, what did you do, Eve? It was the serpent. You see, she's, she's following Adam's example. Note that the word it's plural, sins. If we confess our sins. We don't confess sin as some kind of an abstract. It's not a mere theological construct that we confess. A general spiritual principle that everyone deals with. It's our sins that we confess. Not our neighbors. Not America's. It's my sins. Specifically. And I believe that what John is saying here is that we need to be clear in naming them as we confess our sin. That when we want you to say, Lord, forgive my sin. But that we, we are being specific about our sins. Imagine this prayer. Dear God, please forgive me of my sins. Love to. Which ones? Well, well all of them would be nice. Sure, but why not be specific so you can have confidence I've forgiven them specifically? What oh. sins do you want me to forgive? Uh, uh, okay, uh, forgive me for lying. Which one? You, you mean there was more than one? Mm. Uh, oh, okay, um, forgive me for the sin of exaggeration. Now we're getting somewhere. Which exaggeration? The one you told on Monday at the gym or the two you told on Tuesday at Coffee Bean? I suspect those of us who are born again in this room can all think of a sin to confess. And here's why. Because the Holy Spirit indwells us and the Holy Spirit's always doing some work in us, isn't he? There's always some project that the Holy Spirit is working on us. If he wasn't, we'd be out of here. We'd be done. The fact that we're still here, the Holy Spirit's still working in us, and there's something the Holy Spirit's working. We go through different seasons. We get delivered. We get forgiven. And then it's something else. He reveals something else to us. Amen? That's, that's the way it is. So I imagine it's, okay, well, I can, I can okay, I'm going to confess my sins. Okay, this is, what I, this is first on my mind. This is what the Holy Spirit's doing. 
you kind of get that first one out that you articulate it, and then, okay, keep going. And that's when it gets a little rough. Like, wait, hmm. What, I, what, else, what else is there? We're, we're to confess specific sins. Not generic sin. We can think of one sin, but then as we, well, what about some more? It becomes difficult to name them. We do that because guilt is painful and we've learned how to shut it off. We, we spin doctor, shift blame, we rationalize. Verse 9 is the remedy. Friends, don't save up confession for sin in, in a once-a-week purge. Don't look at confession as taking out the trash. You, know, you, you wheel those things out once a week because garbage is coming tomorrow and you need to you know, get it out. Oh, Empty all the trash in the house and get it out there so we can get it. We eat salmon at our house and we'll wrap it up in foil and then put spices in there, you know, and you put it in the oven and you cook it. And then when you're done, you open up the foil and you take it out and you put it on the plate and the foil goes in the trash. Now, we'll eat f salmon on sa Saturday night and we put the foil in the trash and then we go to church and we get home one, two o'clock in the afternoon and you open up the door into the house. Woo! If you've ever cooked fish in foil and left it in the house for a few hours, Welcome to hell. <laughs> it smells. Your whole house is just reeks. You've got to open up all the windows and turn on the fans and get it out of there. So we have learned, what do you do with the foil when you're finished cooking? You take it out to the trash. You take it all the way out right now. Friends, don't save up confession to once a week. It's Saturday night, going to church tomorrow. Better confess. You know, there's a whole religion that does this going to confession, because you have to go to confession before you can take Mass. And, and it's so that once a week you go and, and you confess, bless me, Father, for, for I have sinned. Okay, like what? None of your business. <laughs> what, what we need to do with confession is we need to confess the moment the Holy Spirit convicts us of it. And let's be honest, sometimes that conviction comes while we're still, we're still <laughs> sinning. Uh, Lord, forgive me for this sin. Don't save it up. Do it the moment the Holy Spirit convicts you. Now, let's be clear. While confession is conditioned on forgiveness, confession is not the basis of forgiveness. God doesn't forgive us because we confess. He forgives because Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. The cross makes forgiveness possible. That forgiveness becomes ours when we receive it by faith, a faith that confesses sin. It sees sin for what it is, that it is wicked and it's worthy of God's wrath. It admits that there's nothing that we can do to expunge sin's guilt. And so it looks outside itself for deliverance. Now take note of the promise that's attached to the condition. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is both faithful and just to forgive us. He's faithful to forgive because that's what Jesus died for. If, if you show up at my house, knock at my door, and hand me a note from my son that says, uh, Pops, um, this person, let this person spend the night in the home. I'm asking you in my name. You know, my response to you is, come on in. Why, why does God forgive us of our sins when we confess them? Why? Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them. He's being faithful to the Son. The Father will always be faithful to the Son. So he's faithful to forgive our sins. He's also just. Again, because of the cross. When God forgives, it's not because He just magically waves away the guilt of our sin as though our sin doesn't really matter. Our sin does matter so much that it cost Christ His life. To forgive someone must pay. Jesus paid. He bears the loss so that we don't have to. 
Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. As John says, God cleanses us from all unrighteousness. There is no sin that God can't forgive. Save one. There is one sin he can't forgive. We'll get back to that in just a moment. But please hear this. There is no sin that God can't forgive when we sincerely agree with him about it. No sin that we commit or that's been committed against us when we surrender it to God that God can't forgive and bring good out of it. Now listen, evil is evil. It will always be evil. God doesn't suddenly switch the tags and make evil good. But what he does is he brings good from evil because he's God. And you know the proof of that? The cross. Is there any evil in all of history greater than the cross? When human beings took God and nailed him to a tree. No greater crime, no greater evil than that. And yet, God has turned it into the greatest good. It's become the means of our salvation. If God can do that with a cross, he can do that with your sin. Sin is evil. But he can bring good out of it when we put it in his hands. Alchemy was a very early form of chemistry. And alchemists' ultimate goal, the big project that they wanted to uh, accomplish, was to turn one thing into something else. And the, the, the big project there was to turn lead into gold. And they believed that they could do that with something called the philosopher's stone. And they were on a constant search for what is the philosopher's stone. They kind of philosophically had an idea. There's this thing. And then they tried all kinds of different chemicals to try to find what is the philosopher's stone that would turn lead into gold. And of course, they never found it because you can't do that. But that's exactly what God does with his forgiveness. He turns our sin into glory. He brings glory out of it. He transmutes it. He transforms it. But the one sin that God can't forgive is the one thing upon which all forgiveness rests, Jesus. The only sin that God won't forgive is rejecting Christ. Because he is the door to eternal life. He is the Savior. You reject him, you reject salvation. You receive him and there is no sin too great for God to forgive. No soul stain that he can't remove. A young girl and her friend were out watching skywriting. Remember when they used to do skywriting? And they were watching this message being written by these planes in the sky. And after four or five letters were in the, uh, the sky, the first letters would dissolve. And she said to her friend, she said, God must have a very big eraser. He does. It's called the blood of Jesus Christ. He erases our sin. That's why, look at verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. All sin. Verse 9 it says it as well. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You know, the, the devil is clever. He's, he's very good at that sin thing. He first tempts us by, by saying that sin is no big deal. He, he diminishes the threat of guilt. We've all experienced this. Tem temptation comes and, and he blinds us to the consequences of sin. He does, it, we, we, it's like we have amnesia ahead of time. All we see is the pleasure, is the, the promise of sin. And we don't even think about the guilt that we're going to feel. Because he, it's like he, he just masks us to it. And then we give in to temptation, we yield to it, and what does he do? He hammers over us over the head with guilt. Now, he doesn't do that with unbelievers, but he does it with Christians. Well, think of this. We can all say, yeah, that's my experience. We're tempted, we don't think about the guilt, we give in, and then we're consumed with the guilt. Oh, how could I have done that? I feel so bad. And he just beats us over the head with it. And we, we get to this place where we think, God can never use me. Look at me. I'm so, f I'm so bad. I, I constantly sin. I'm, your life becomes filled with guilt. God can't possibly use someone like me. 
condemnation is so heavy and so thick, we're convinced all we'll ever have is God's reluctant acceptance of us. We think that he forgives only because he said he would, but wishes he had never made that promise in our case. Friends, listen, that is a lie that is birthed in the mouth of your adversary. If he can't keep you from being saved, he'll try to keep you from being used by God. And then he does that by overwhelming you with feelings of condemnation, making you think that feeling bad is penance for your sin. So listen to this. Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, The blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Verse 9, He cleanses us from all sin. All unrighteousness. Your guilt, your self-flagellation, it's not penance. It's unbelief. Let me say it again. You're you're feeling bad. You're, You're heaping feeling bad on yourself. I need to feel bad about my failure. It's my way to show God I'm sincere. Do you realize what you're doing? You you may say, I'm not Roman Catholic. I don't do penance. Yes, you are. When when you say, I have to feel bad about my sin for a certain amount of time before I can go to him and ask him to forgive me, to show him how sincere I am, you know what you're doing? You're saying, my my feeling bad, my regret is penance. What What do you do with your sin? You confess it. God, it was wrong. I was wrong. I deserve your judgment. But Jesus Christ took my judgment on himself. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. And let him forgive you. And then stand in faith that he has forgiven you. Because he is faithful and just to forgive the sins that we confess to him. Confess. Listen. Confess means to, do you remember what it means? To agree with God. You see, we don't just confess that it's wrong. We confess that once we've confessed, once we've agreed that it's wrong and asked him to forgive us, we have been forgiven. Your your confession needs to go all the way. Not just, I sinned. It needs to be, I sinned, but I am now forgiven. That's our confession in Christ. I sinned, but I am now clean. I am now forgiven. And I will not stand in the unbelief of guilt and condemnation because Jesus Christ cleanses me from all sin. Some of you labor under a burden of guilt and condemnation. You feel because of what you have done, God can only just, you know, there's going to be a bunch of people when, they, when we get to heaven, God's going to be, come on in, come on in, and you're going to get there and he's going to be like, hold on, let them go first. And then your group can come on in. No. That's the enemy. He's, he's lied to you. You are forgiven. You are clean. You are in Christ. And he sees you in the righteousness of his son. Stand in faith free of your past. You're clean. It feels really good to be clean. 